Um, hey, good afternoon for those on the East Coast. I should say good at, good evening for anybody dialing in from Europe and good morning for anyone else. Uh, my name is Bob Turnus, and I'm the Director of Client Delivery here at Applied Frameworks. Uh, for those of you who are new to Applied Frameworks, uh, we are a consulting and training shop with a few main areas of focus. We focus on Lean and Agile, is they're containerized in Safe and Scrum. We focus on product management. And then we also have our own framework dedicated to helping organizations understand and maximize the profitability of software and then software enabled uh, solutions as well. Um, I'll say, if you want to install Jira and proclaim your agile transformation complete, there's probably a shop that can help you. But instead, if you're looking to create sustainable uh, transformation, um, we'd love to help you. We really focus on creating um, self-sufficient and self-sufficiency uh, with the use of transformation and those lean and agile frameworks that we mentioned earlier. And if that's of interest, we'd love to, to help you out. So let's get into uh, today's webinar. So for companies in size from startups to established organizations, software profitability um, isn't absolutely critical to nail, but pretty close if you're looking to maximize your profitability. And for that reason, that personally, I'm really excited to participate in our webinar today and um, to discuss strategy for pricing software. Leading the discussion will be Jason Tanner, who's our CEO. And Jason has been uh, transforming organizations as a consultant for 14 years and is one of our content authors. So as we get started here, a couple of housekeeping items. Thanks for using your chat to discuss uh, where you're from. And if you have questions, we'd instead prefer, well, you can use the chat, but also lodge them into the Q&A function that allows us to pick them up, pull them into dialogue as appropriate, and then also get you answers in that same function. So Q&A, if you're not familiar with Zoom, is on the same bar as chat and use it to, to drop again any questions or even thoughts that you have about a particular topic or item that we're discussing. Another housekeeping item is that we are recording this session and afterwards we'll make both the recording as well as the deck that Jason will be presenting available afterwards. So with that, Jason, um, I will turn it over to you to talk about software pricing strategies. Great, thanks, Bob. So are you seeing my screen? We are indeed, yep. Awesome, great. So let me go through the quick agenda. So uh, right in the middle of the introduction, I wanna introduce a model for thinking about software pricing cover the 10 pricing strategies, and then flag three strategies to avoid uh, with the final Q&A. And I like to do these very naturally. If there's a question that comes up on a particular slide, ask away, Bob will moderate, and uh, really want to give you an opportunity to get the most you can out of this. So Bob briefly introduced me already. Uh, my, my origin story really goes back to product management. So I've been dealing with software product management problems and creating uh, great software products really since 2001 where I was working on a billing solution with a lot of complexity. So uh, there's a lot of challenges to being a, a successful software product manager and that's really why we're doing what we're doing. We are really focused on helping companies become more sustainable uh, so our, our why, our reason for doing the work that we do is because sustainable businesses are key to growth in uh, the world. And that's really where we want to help out by ensuring that companies have viable business models that generate sufficient profit to maintain sustainability. So that's what we're doing. And uh, really why I came up with the topic for this webinar, because we're writing a book about this topic uh, focused on software profit streams, how you can build uh, great solutions enabled by software and deliver them to your customers. So that's me. Uh, focus here is what's the price? You know, one of the key questions that comes up when you're thinking about launching a new product or if you have an existing product, what's the price that we can set to be successful in the market, ensure we have a positive return 
And that's why we're here uh, and what we're going to focus on. So to start, uh, I want to introduce the Profit Stream Canvas because the system of how to create a successful business model for a software solution really relies on a set of interrelated choices. So this pricing strategy is just one of many choices to make. So here's the canvas. Uh, and I really want to focus on the top layer because that's really where we start almost all the time. And obviously the customer is critical here. So this side of the canvas is all about the customer. So I'm going to make some assumptions that I go into this discussion about pricing and pricing strategies in that we've already identified the customer. We have some sense of what the customer values from our solution. So the customer has a problem. We're going to develop some type of solution to deliver value to the customer. Uh, as a result, we sort of figured out these two key uh, parts of the model. We've got the problem uh, solution fit, and we've got some sense of our solution market fit. Now, I'm going to mention value exchange model, and the value exchange really defines how we're going to exchange our solution for money. So an example, I'm going to offer a subscription. I'm going to have some sort of time-based access value exchange model. Other options might be I'm going to charge a small uh, percentage for every transaction. Uh, another option might be that I'm going to provide some type of service to enrich the value of my product. So there's lots of choices to make here about value exchange, which will then drive pricing choices. So as we uh, go through the uh, pricing strategies, I'll, I'll intermingle some, some uh, examples and some terminology that effectively uh, identifies some of these relationships between the solution we're providing to specific customers, the value exchange model, and how they affect your choice of pricing strategies. So with that as the backdrop, I want to talk about the pricing model that we've identified for ProfitStream success. So. This is really about using systems thinking to uh, manage all of the aspects of your entire pricing system to maximize profit over time. And it's a simple model with multiple layers. So the top layer, the focus of this webinar is the strategy. How are you going to compete and position your product relative to competition? The next step in the topic of our next webinar will be structure which is the pricing ideas that you have for different segments, because I can price differently for different segments, and the specific attributes of my solution. This will include things like identifying the price metric. If I'm going to offer a subscription, is a subscription based on number of users? Is it based on the uh, number of uh, other, some other attribute that I may establish, like the uh, total count? Uh, there's all sorts of options there for establishing a metric. The next step is to actually get the specific price level set. How much will I charge? That's where we actually get to the number or the price, uh, as well as some uh, other ideas related to the, uh, how do I separate my different types of segments? I've got to create fences between segments because not everybody's going to be equal uh, in terms of how they're going to purchase a product. They have different needs and they may have more needs than other segments, which means I can price I can price differently for different segments. But I have to establish reasonable and acceptable fences between those segments. And finally, policies. I need to establish ways to protect my profitability to avoid excessive ad hoc discounting by establishing some policies and processes that are clear and concise. Then I can enable our sales and marketing teams to be successful in how they go to market and protect profitability. So that's the profit stream pricing model. Our focus today, strategy, in the future we'll be getting into the other details. So uh, the first interactive activity I have for us is to uh, do a word cloud. So Bob is gonna drop this link into chat, which is a Mentimeter link. Uh, if you already have uh, another browser open or if you have the Menti app, uh, I've got the code there as well. And let me switch over here. And this is a key question. What pricing strategies do you already know about? Do you already use a current pricing strategy or 
you've heard about different strategies, add up to five pricing strategies that you already know or have heard about. And what we're going to do is use Menti to build a word cloud. So if you look in the chat, find that link. And uh, and, and as well, uh, Jason, it says, can we open voting? It says that voting is closed. There you go. Perfect. So sorry, that takes care of the voting. And, uh, and Jason, I'm actually going to copy and paste value-based pricing, which is uh, a great uh, pricing strategy. I'm going to paste, paste that into Menti so that we can start building that word cloud. Awesome. You see my Halloween themed uh, pumpkin there. All right. One time perpetual, great value base, transaction, flat fee. Cost plus, we'll talk about the, the danger of cost plus. Freemium. Sounds very spooky, Jason. <laughs> there are some spooky strategies to be aware of. ROI based, yes. Yeah, so per feature and per, per user, definitely relevant to price structure. Uh, when we, and those, those are great examples of uh, identifying price metrics. Definitely looks like value base is the most popular. Penetration, great. That's right at the top of our list, dynamic. Awesome. Rear end extraction price. Love to know more about that. Lost leader, good. Excellent. So another 30 seconds here and we'll keep driving on. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> Someone pulls a price out of it. Yes, unfortunately, that happens. Awesome. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Greg, for that. Okay, so let's dive into the 10 strategies for software enabled solutions. So, the, the context here also, keep in mind, is I I'm, I'm really want to be broad. I want to cover not only uh, business to business products. Uh, also business to consumer products. And we also are identifying in the book that we're writing business to professional. Uh, so something you might want to buy yourself for your own professional development. My favorite example is if you pay for a LinkedIn premium by yourself, that would be a B2P purchase. So some of these strategies may be like, oh, I can't imagine how this will work for B2B. That could be true. There's so many strategies that are lend themselves more to consumer products. Others lend themselves really well to B2B uh, solutions. So I want to start with uh, penetration, one of the ones that was pointed out in Menti. Uh, really what we're looking at here is pricing low for growth uh, as a starting point. Now, uh, with penetration, the uh, good outcome is that you can attract customers quickly to a new product However, there's a downside here. You do want to ensure that you have some plan to raise your prices in the future as product adoption increases. So you don't want to get trapped into a place where your customers expect those low prices forever. So a penetration strategy has to be very thoughtful and very deliberate where you can enter a market, gain uh, a lot of visibility, a lot of, of uh, new customers, uh, attract them, deliver great value, and then progressively think about how you want to shift strategy to uh, increase pricing and profitability. 
so the other disadvantage is that competitors may respond. If you come in with a low price, your competitors may drop their prices and suddenly you're not as attractive as you once were when you started. Uh, and then if, if you're not careful, you can lose the most price sensitive customers if you attempt to raise prices. So it's gotta be very thoughtful in how you position the penetration strategy. A uh, great example of penetration uh, right now is FreshBooks. So FreshBooks competitor to one of the most popular accounting solutions for small to medium sized business, which is QuickBooks. Uh, they're pricing way underneath QuickBooks for initial uh, product with a penetration strategy. It's a great penetration strategy because it's time bound. So a 60% offer, off, offer for four months reduces the price from $15 a month to $6 a month. But after that period, once somebody's gotten used to the product, they like it for four months, they may be willing to pay for the continued use of the uh, solution FreshBooks offers. So a great example uh, to use and a good idea potentially for entering a new market. But I, I definitely recommend using this uh, for only a limited time and then shifting to one of the other strategies. Okay, the second one is premium and premium really is just high premium price. I'm going to set a price uh, significantly higher than competitors based on positioning of a superior product, uh, brand strength, or exceptionally high quality. And the real uh, objective here is to deliver such superior performance and service and additional value over uh, competitors that you can actually maintain these high prices. And the classic example, of course, is Apple's iPhone. One of the few times uh, in fact, maybe one of the first times in history where we have a luxury brand that is actually dominating in terms of share. Uh, so premium, great strategy when you can actually deliver a premium product relative to the competition. Next is competitive. And competitive really about following the market. So you're setting the price based on competitor prices or the cost of substitutes. And the choice of where to set the price relative to competitors may be higher or lower, depending on how you want to position the product and generate the maximum profitability. Uh, and this is a great example because Paramount Plus and Peacock are extremely competitive and they've set the exact same price, $4.99 a month at the uh, basic level. So ideal example of a competitive strategy which may apply for uh, a product that is entering an existing market. A uh, very popular strategy when you want to enter a market with something unique that's differentiated and from a customer point of view, uh, they want to have, be able to compare easily. It may be a good strategy to select to uh, enter a market with a new product or solution. Next is stable. So stable is just smooth pricing. So there may be a lot of variability in usage, uh, maybe a high variability in how, how people are uh, accessing the product, the number of people accessing the product. There's, when there's a lot of variability, you want to uh, smooth out the price uh, for the uh, uh, buyer. So in effect, you wanna remove all the variability in use or in how people pay. So uh, another uh, consideration here is uh, to avoid too much fluctuation in, for example, the monthly bill. So by smoothing out the pricing, it make it a lot easier for customers to wrap their head around what the solution is gonna to provide to them and how they can pay to receive the value. So when, you're ex when your customers may experience a lot of variability, a stable pricing strategy makes uh, a lot of sense. So uh, Slack is a great example. There's all sorts of different uh, cases of uh, uh, how, how much, uh, how many messages all of the users of Slack will send each day, each month. However, we just play, pay a, a flat fee. Uh, another example uh, is utility pricing particularly in, for customers in cold climates or extremely hot climates where they're gonna have high spikes in usage in either the winter or the summer. Uh, utilities offer some uh, stable pricing plans, particularly for customers uh, in a, in a, with lower income. They can smooth out their spending. Uh, effectively, the utilities will average out what the cost will be over the course of the year and they pay one flat monthly fee, even though they may have a high variation in usage uh, in particular months or seasons. 
The next strategy, another one pointed out in the polling earlier, is dynamic pricing. So this is really demand-based pricing. So uh, price adjusts up or down based on customer demand. So we actually maximize profit at the exact time that customers are ready to pay and ready to purchase the solution. Uh, and then you can increase price as demand increases. The most common implementation is also the reverse, which is lower prices as more people buy, which is less common. Uh, best example is uh, Uber, Lyft, uh, rideshare products, as well as airlines have really mastered dynamic demand-based pricing. Next strategy is high-low. So this is really about deliberate discounting. So I really want to design uh, a, a price strategy around products that have a limited time of attractiveness. The price is set high initially when the product is most, deliable, uh, most desired and then lower often dramatically as interest or relevance declines. Great example is video games. So sports related video games have a very limited time horizon for when they're most popular right in the preseason and then towards the end of the season as the season's ending demand is going to drop off and they're already thinking about their uh, next release for the following season. Um, so it's a very popular business to consumer strategy. However, it may apply to a B2B products if you have a plan to offer new versions with significant upgrades over time. So you may want to launch the initial product at a high price and then maybe six to 12 months before you come up with your next product, you can start to decrease in the price. And then when you launch the new product, launch it again at a higher price. So in, in some ways, as you're planning a your roadmap and the obsolescence of existing products, you can come back into the market with the next version at a higher price. Next strategy is economy. And economy really is a, is a good strategy if you have a budget product. So if you want to appeal to a cost conscious customer segment that's very price sensitive, an economy pricing strategy can be very effective, particularly if you want to complement more expensive products in your portfolio. So I may deliver a no frills type of product uh, to uh, meet the basic needs of uh, customers that may be very attractive to price sensitive people who only want to get the basic solution uh, and then can uh, offer a set of uh, more expensive, higher capability products as well to other segments. So very uh, attractive strategy. Dollar Shave Club is a great example. It really came into the market with a budget product with a subscription as a means of exchanging value. Uh, however, super successful, ultimately acquired for a very nice uh, exit for the founders. Next strategy is skimming, and skimming is a, is a really interesting strategy. It's a very progressive strategy to continuously skim profit from the sales and demand of a product over time. So I want to maintain high price as much as, as high as I can. As the market matures, I may make deliberate changes to the price to lower it and then skim product uh, profit at the next level. So I'm just going to keep adjusting the price very carefully based on what's happening in the market. So as competition, other, uh, other forces may drive the price lower. Then I can make a decision to lower the price progressively and, and then skim at the next level. So uh, this is a, a very deliberate strategy, it requires a lot of uh, good, careful market analysis to keep track of what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, as we were uh, preparing and rehearsing on Friday, uh, one concept came up with this idea of, of deterioration uh, of features and value over time, uh, which is discussed a lot in uh, Scaled Agile, uh, in the Scaled Agile framework. The same concept applies here, where we've got a deterioration of, of value or price to value over time, and we can capture uh, the profitability at different price levels as we slowly and deliberately uh, lower the prices. Two classic examples is consumer electronics, like DVD players, high, defin high definition TVs. When the latest technology releases, I want to set the highest price possible and maintain that price as high as possible. And if I'm the leader and I get the first product out there, but then my competitors follow suit, I may have pressure to lower the price and I want to skim at the next price level. And cars, uh, another example where you may see frequent changes in pricing, particularly as a model year comes to an end.
uh, the, the car manufacturers are attempting to skim as much profit as possible before they have the next product available in the market. Next strategy is loss leader. And loss leader is actually an effective tra uh, strategy to generate attraction. So the idea is to offer a very highly discounted product alongside more expensive products uh, with the uh, recognition that the product may not be profitable at all. So this inexpe inexpensive product may be offered at a loss to generate sales of more expensive products. And Dropbox actually is a great example of this. And you notice at the bottom, they've actually buried the uh, free product at the bottom of the page now. So uh, really they're drawing the attention to their plus product, the paid product, as much as possible. However, however, they still have the loss leader free available. Uh, interestingly, I did a little bit of research on Dropbox. As of June of this year, Dropbox has over 700 million registered users, but only 17.37 million users are paying for the product. So that may be the reason why they really want to de-emphasize the free product because they really want to convert customers to the paid product. Uh, so uh, another example uh, is computer printers. Uh, the printer is actually offered at, potentially at a loss because the manufacturers are going to make up the uh, difference in the profit with their ink cartridge sales. So strategy is really good if you uh, have a plan for how you want to uh, protect the overall portfolio of products. So a loss leader usually fits best into a portfolio of other products. And the 10th strategy, another one identified during our work cloud game is value-based. We really want to be focused on the customer. So the idea is we have an outside-in approach to focus on customers, their needs, and their perceptions. So really want to align the price to the customer's perception of value that they're receiving from the solution. This really is going to focus on maximizing the profit. It allows us to price higher than competitors who just cannot deliver the same level of value or communicate the same level of value. So customer focus and value-based is really a very strong way to go. Uh, really where we uh, describe everything in, a, in the forthcoming book is around this idea of aligning value to price to generate maximum profit. Uh, three great examples. Uh, Norden uh, has truly aligned uh, over really decades now uh, their pricing for value. Uh, Starbucks, uh, definitely value-based, uh, which means that people are really happy to you know, have their products, get their products every morning, and pay a fair price for it. Uh, same with Adobe, another great example of a value-based pricing uh, strategy. So those are the 10 strategies uh, for software-enabled solution. I'll pause here and see what questions I can answer before moving on. So Bob, any questions? There are none in the Q&A or chat, but we would be interested in uh, questions or thoughts. Oh, uh, and, and Jay mentions in the chat, is there an example of a Starbucks product that's value-based? So the reason I include Starbucks in the example is that when the pricing of uh, the Frappuccino, for example, is established, they are calibrating to not only their cost to deliver the product, which is actually significantly lower than what they're offering, but they have matched what people are uh, paying every for every cup to the value they receive. So that's why they're so popular. People are actually uh, standing in line in the drive-through as well, uh, and their their price actually uh, is is set based on what they are observing as. Uh, people's willingness to pay. So they're aligning the value people get from having that drink in their hand every morning uh, to what they can capture as the price. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and another uh, question, and this is a, a really interesting um, thought process here. Uh, Robin mentions in the chat that she'd like to know the, or he or she would like to know the best indicators to know when you should use one method over the other. Yeah, I actually say value-based to the last because I actually think that's the place to start. 
So the better we can understand the total value that customers receive from the solution, the more capable we are of identifying how to quantify that value and align the pricing to uh, delivering that value. Uh, so that's really the starting point. Uh, I think after that, uh, the decision process will be around and premium and economy being on the same line is, is actually deliberate because if I'm thinking about starting with value, then I gotta ask my question, do I actually have the ability to position as a premium product relative to competition or alternatives? And that would be where I would go next is if I hit that bar, I can get above the bar of being premium. I wanna maximize what I can capture uh, from the marketplace, I'll go premium. The flip side is choices. Am I actually trying to enter an existing market? Well, then I wanna penetrate the market uh, catch up to competition with that lower price and then have a plan to compete in the future and may raise my price and become more competitive. So penetration and competitive usually go hand in hand. Um, the others like uh, stable choices or dynamic are really very much dependent on the solution. So if I actually have a solution with high variability in usage or how people would pay, I wanna consider a stable strategy. Uh, on the flip side, if I actually can't adjust price based on demand, I'd be dynamic. A dynamic may not fit with uh, any products. For example, dynamic pricing would make no sense with Slack. Even though there's high demand periods throughout the week in particular, we, as customers, we wouldn't want to have such variability in what we're paying. As a result, uh, they chose something different. Um, I say that the loss leader, skimming, and high low are, are almost specialized strategies. Uh, a lot less uh, uh, used relative to the other options, but they're still valuable to know. And just so to, to put a finer point on this, after researching for the past couple of months uh, and writing about pricing, uh, these are the uh, consolidation of many different terms. So, and, and it was actually kind of interesting to see how these terms have been labeled differently by different people. So I'm trying to converge everything into a, a more clear set um, of choices. Uh, the principles I think continue, uh, apply to all of them. Who are the customers and customer segments that I want to uh, serve? How do they perceive value? How do I position the value of my solution to those customers? And then I can choose the strategy to identify the price to provide my solution. That's about 50 pages of the book in a nutshell. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, Jason, do we have time for a couple more questions in this section? There? Yes. Okay, great. There's one that's uh, it's a little bit simpler and one that's more meaty. Um, and Greg, uh, I think you ask a great question here, which is, you're you're curious about the difference between competitive pricing and skimming, and you posit or you're curious that to know if skimming, to define it, is that you're always trying to stay on the high side of the competitor's pricing. So, the main difference between competitive and skimming, and illustrated really by Peacock and Paramount Plus, is I'm setting the price and trying to get into the market and be. Uh, perceived as uh, within a competitive price range. It might be on the little bit higher side, maybe a little bit lower side of competition or wherever the median is at a competition, but I'm dialed into some range uh, dictated by uh, the series of options people have for uh, making a choice. And we were actually discussing Salesforce and their strategy on Friday. And I was thinking that I thought Salesforce really high end for large enterprises, they're actually not the premium option of CRM or customer relationship management solutions. They're at the top of the competitive range for enterprise solutions, uh, which I found was interesting. So when I, when, if you looked and just did some quick market analysis on CRM solutions, pretty broad uh, band of pricing, uh, which effectively is usually per month, per user, and this band is, is really fascinating because there's about half a dozen competitors all within 25 to $40 a month per user. Uh, 
which I found really uh, a great example of competitive. They're, they're not, and they're going to stay there, right? They're probably going to stay there for, for, you know, 12, 24 months. They're not going to see a lot of variability as opposed to skimming. So skimming really, I think, only is applied to products that have a limited time of attractiveness. Like, and, and we're seeing less and less of this now as we've, we're shifting uh, from the buying the software on a disk or downloading the version uh, and having a perpetual license. And then eventually, you know, two years later, the new product is launched and you have to install the new software. Now we're getting software as a service on demand uh, when we want it. So if I'm thinking about skimming, the product or the solution is going to have a limited period of attractiveness. It'll only be good for uh, until the next newest technology or upgraded product is available. So if I'm going to choose a skimming strategy and I'm monitoring effectively over time what is happening with the competition before I choose to lower my price uh, and then skim at the next level. So that's really, I think, the most significant difference is competitive. I'm trying to stay within that range for as long as possible versus skimming where I actually have a plan for uh, checking the market and lowering prices, the attractiveness decreases uh, over the time period. Excellent, thank you. Um, and, and one more question on this section coming from Jason. His question, reading it verbatim, how do you deal with PR blowbacks of value-based, uh, the value-based uh, uh, pricing strategy? In other words, if you offer the product to one user base for a certain price because they have a medium footprint, versus offering to a larger firm for perhaps double that pricing. Yeah, so a great topic and, and I hope you come back for the structure webinar and I'll, I'll give a brief preview for it because price fences is part of setting the structure. So the notion of creating a stratification between segments which effectively are fences is predicated on the clarity of the differences. So I can offer one price at a, I can offer one solution at a lower price to my value base segment who only want a limited offering. They only want to host 25 webinars a year. Or they only want to have the ability to save 10,000 records. At the next level, and this is a purchase fence that is set based on the different in, difference in the solution, they want 100 webinars a year and they want 100,000 contacts. So whatever the fence is, it's got to be clear of I'm getting more value at the higher level. So to, to, to avoid the blowback, the fences have to be so clear and the differentiation between the two different segments is so clear and the price is so different that it's clear to uh, any potential customers of why they're paying one price over the other. They've made the choice to pay the higher price because they want more capability or a different product. Uh, in the other webinar, I'll be talking about other types of fences like location fences, time of purchase fences, and so on. Okay, okay uh, that uh, concludes the questions for this section. Um, great thoughts from everybody. Uh, thanks, Robin and Jason, for the questions, as well as Saeed for the thoughts on strategy. Um, and Jason, I'll let you get to the next section. Great. So three strategies to avoid. The first strategy to avoid is customer-driven pricing. So I want to avoid this scenario. You want to be frustrated and scratching your head, wondering uh, what's going wrong when nobody's buying the product because you did your research and they told you what they were willing to pay. So setting the price only based on basic research of willingness to pay is something you want to avoid. Uh, the primary reason is that when asked, most customers do not have insufficient knowledge or experience to evaluate the product's value. Uh, they may also not be 100% honest or capable of giving you a good, a good answer. So the big downside here is that the price you set is much lower than the real value of the product, which is gonna decrease the profitability. So we definitely wanna avoid simply asking customers what they're willing to pay. Uh, you won't get the best data. There's other techniques to use to uh, do pricing research that go beyond a simple willingness to pay question. Uh, and we'll get into the, those techniques in future webinars as well. Next strategy to avoid is simply cost plus pricing. 
So this results in this problem. Customers thanking you for giving you such a great deal or giving them such a great deal when they would have actually paid more for the product. So cost-based pricing is setting the price based on your cost to build, maintain, and sell the product plus a desired margin. The problem here is that you may be overpricing for some segments or severely underpricing for markets and customer segments with much higher demand who are willing to pay more for your solution. So simply using cost plus pricing will not result in the highest profitability you can achieve. Next one to avoid is obsessing over market share. So this strategy is, has been popular for decades and is starting to shift in Silicon Valley and for lots of startups where the idea is all focused on growth. Let's gain lots of customers, if we generate share quickly, we'll win. Profits will come later. Uh, we don't just want to uh, blindly set the lowest possible price to gain share without thinking about the modeling. So I'm gonna paint a very bright line here. Obsessing over share is a distracting vanity metric. Share is only relevant as a driver of profitability. So I want to very much dis differentiate the idea of penetration pri pricing as a strategy that actually has intention to change quickly over time or built into it like FreshBooks, a limited duration of availability of the penetration price. So market share pricing, cost plus pricing, and customer driven pricing are the three strategies you really want to avoid. So what final questions could I answer? Any new ones come in, Bob? There are no, none in the chat or in the QA. All right, great. So my next webinar uh, will be on the 29th. So I hope you come back and join us for pricing structure. Uh, we have another webinar from Applied Frameworks this week on Thursday from my colleague, Joel Bancroft Connors, popular topic, Agile Metrics. So if you're interested in that, uh, certainly hope you can register. And the book, our target availability is Q1. So if you'd like to be on early access to notifications about the book, uh, please do let us know in chat and we'll add you to the list. So I say we're in pre-pre-launch, <laughs> but we do want to have some, uh, keep people informed of when the book will be ready to go. Excellent. Well, well, Beth, thanks for your kind words. Um, we hope this has been informative to, uh, to your point, and uh, we're delighted to share our expertise uh, for you folks, uh, with you folks rather. Um, Greg uh, mentions that he'd like to know about the book's availability. Great, add him to the list. Awesome. Perfect, Greg, you're on the list. Um, anybody else, if you'd like to be on the list, um, either drop your name in chat or feel free to send me an email. And my email address is really easy. It's bob at uh, AppliedFrameworks.com. Um, otherwise, thanks everybody for joining us today. Hopefully this has been illuminating. Uh, we look forward to talking to you folks again in the future about uh, maximizing software powered uh, and sustainable profitability. Otherwise, thanks so much for your time and um, we'll talk soon.